Uh, so we, uh, we're moving on to the next session, uh, which is, uh, is spirituality a compass for business? Uh, this is going to be a very interesting session again. Uh, we have uh, His Holiness Radhanath Swami Maharaj. Um, we have Dr. Ajay Piramal, Mr. Ashish Chauhan, and the session is going to get coordinated by, moderated by Srijit Mishra. So if you could please ask the panelists uh, to uh, kindly come up to the stage. So with that, um, I will uh, leave the session with, uh, with, with Srijit uh, for an interesting session. So ladies and gentlemen, could you request you to please put your hands together for, for the panel and uh, look forward to an interesting session. Thank you, uh, Artha, for this opportunity. First of all, it's been a very, very wonderful experience. I'm honored to be here. It's been rich and full of learning for me. What I take back in these eight hours is absolute uh, happiness and learning from all that I've heard since morning. Thank you very much. Um, what can I say? It's also an honor to have a panel like uh, the panel that is here. So I'll try and do justif uh, justice to, uh, to try and see what questions I can ask. Um, well, today it's a, it's a VUCA world. It's very, very volatile, uncertain, ambiguous, and complex. In this world, what's certainly happening is stress and strains are going up. Um, organizations are going through stresses, individuals are going through stresses, youngsters are looking for their passions, they take much longer to join an organization, they're looking for a fit with the organization, the kind of job that they do. It's no longer that it is, as, you know, that, uh, that it is an organization that is available and a youngster would join. So there is a lot that's happening in the context that we have. In this situation, many people and organizations are finding that there is more to life than just business or profits. And in this context, my first question is to Ajay Yu. In today's context for most businesses, uh, really, it is very important to get to profits. But spirituality is given a bit of a second rung. Do you think they are mutually exclusive? And I just want to understand if they are not, at what point in your life did this make the change? So, in my humble opinion, spirituality is a way of life. So how can you separate if business is most of your life? You cannot separate about it. Separate it. In an environment today where you have people from very different faiths working with us, we have people in different countries. We have more than 2,000 people working in the United States itself, for instance. And we have people working in every country. I mean, more than 100 countries. Yet some basic principles, I think, of for mankind remain the same. And we, for instance, have as our values, which everybody has to live by, and we have to work in the business, is knowledge, action and care, which is actually gyan, karma and bhakti. And we found that when we've uh, put these uh, values across to people across the world, they all have, they can relate to it. It is in some ways embracing, I think, all faiths. And yet it is actually the basis is from Vedic scriptures, but it is so universal. And, and when people have this as a base, I find that they connect better and they want to work with you. So it's not only people today are not only looking, I think, for just mere uh, uh, a monetary compensation, but they want to work in an environment which is value-based because they feel basic human nature, I think, wants to live by values. Sometimes we get diverted, but I think all basically... At the root, I feel that all of us are value-driven, and that's what we try to do. Thank you. Uh, Ashish, uh, in your case, do you think that it is mutually exclusive? Uh, is, is, there a, is there a way by which you think uh, spirituality shapes leadership, motivates people? What's your view? I think I agree with Ajay completely that basically uh, all of us have to uh, combine both. In a sense, we live life, right? And in some sense, spirituality, the business, uh, the family, uh, friends, everything is part of the same whole. So 
if you don't have a balance in one, uh, you have imbalance in other also. So effectively, it's a very strange thing. And uh, somewhere, if you look back at uh, what I call recent Indian history, the questions themselves also look like more from a perspective of a, a, a kind of a Christian situation where they have separated the religion or spirituality from the day-to-day -day life. And that came into our elites because most of them studied in convent schools. And so uh, it, it kind of, they read any Blyton and P.G. Woodhouse and stuff. But many of us who come from vernacular, we don't even see any kind of uh, dilemma at all. This is, uh, I mean, it's a one continuous whole. And most of us want to connect our life uh, and make a meaning within the context we are in, not in the context of uh, um, kind of 18th century England or so on and so forth. But our names, Arjun or Bhim or Shankaracharya or Shiva, I mean, these are stuff we grew up with. Uh, and it, it's, I mean, it, we never thought that this is kind of different or it's, it's, it's something where you come out of home, and go to office, you have kind of a shut off your other side of life. We continue to live the same life uh, and that's what most of India is, I think. Thank you. Uh, Swamiji, a small question for you. Uh, you know, this, the organizations today are becoming heterogeneous, in the sense, heterogeneous. There are lots of people who are Indians, there are non-Indians, there are people from different religious backgrounds, there are people from different backgrounds that come and work uh, in, a, in a country, and it happens in any country in this world today. And we are seeing perhaps uh, in many cases the religion beginning to creep in into this, into this angle as well. And people become a little more restless of each other. The question specifically to you is that in an organizational context, does spirituality and religion go hand in hand? How do you balance the difference in practices and the diversity that people have? In previous generations, religions, races, were very much in different countries, in different sections of the world. But today, everything is more integrated than ever before. And this type of social merging brings about challenges and opportunities. The challenge is there's so much reason for conflict. The opportunity is to understand that now we have a necessity to appreciate unity in diversity. Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jew, Jain, Sikh, Parsi, agnostic, atheist. What is the essence? Where is the unity in the diversity? In my own life, I'm from America, which is called a melting pot because the only actual indigenous Americans are the American Indians. Everyone in power in America came mostly in pursuit of religious freedom or social freedom because they were being um, persecuted in other countries. I saw in America of the various religions so much sectarianism. Each religion, there's a sector of people who truly believe that they have the monopoly over God and the kingdom of God. And each one has scriptures and tradition and saints to support 
their conclusions. I saw so much hate in the name of a God that everyone considered to be loving. So I came to a crossroads in my life. Either I have to totally reject all religion, or I have to find that there's a common essence within all of them. And from the core of my soul, I believe there was a common essence within all of them. And it is there. To love God and to love your neighbor as yourself is the basis of every true spiritual tradition. And when we actually, in, in today's world, in business, recently I spoke at the HSBC Bank on this very point, because they have so many people of so many races and so many nationalities and so many religions working in the same office. How do they work together? <laughs> I gave an example. They gave me this garland or mala, and it had about 10 different flowers on it. There were roses and there was gardenias and so many flowers, different colors, different textures, different fragrances. But when they have a common thread, they create something very beautiful. And it's very, very important for leaders of society, religious leaders, business leaders, media leaders, to actually enlighten people in the common thread that we all have in common. Just a couple weeks ago, I spoke at the Oxford Union in a debate whether extremism justified, whether extremism in defense of liberty was a vice or not. If we approach this subject from the perspective of being an American or an Indian or a Hindu or a Muslim or Christian, we're gonna have a particular perspective. If we approach it as human beings, then we see what we all have in common. And if we approach it as eternal souls, living beings who are all a part of the same God, then we could really appreciate unity and diversity. And I believe in today's world, this is one of the greatest needs for leaders in all fields of life to enlighten the people about our unity on a spiritual basis. Thank you, Sarajit. It was really, uh, it's about allowing the, the human in the human being to come out. It's allowing the God in each one of us to come out. Uh, the question uh, I would like to ask next uh, is to you. In, in the definition of spirituality could vary from I mean, I've heard people talk about spirituality and business. Uh, I've been lucky to work in two organizations, my current organization of Times of India and Unilever, where I worked 24 years, to understand the importance of spirituality and business. But the definition of spirituality and business differs. In some, to, for some people, it is about personal values. To some, it's about treating people and co-workers uh, and employees in a responsible, caring way. And for some others, it's about making the business socially responsible. The concept of triple business uh, uh, line is well known. It's not just profits. It's about values, ethics. It's about people, planet, and profit. Just wanted to understand your view as to how you have defined it for your organization. We've, as a, we've not defined spirituality, but we've defined what are our values. And what is the purpose of our organization. So let me just talk a little bit first about purpose. So we believe that we, our purpose is doing well and doing good and making a difference in the world around us by living our values. So what are we saying? It is not doing well, whatever we do, whether it is a CSR activity, 
or whether it is a business. We have to do well in it. So we have to try and achieve what is the best that we can, even if it is a CSR, let's say. And it also has to do good. So whatever activity that we are doing, it has to also contribute to being good. So for instance, if you are making drugs, we are saying that it is an activity which is alleviating human suffering. And therefore, the purpose is to do well and to do good. And then we say that making a positive difference to the world around us. Again, in that we say that human beings are the only living creatures. You get, as they say, a human life after millions of births as so many other living orgasm, you, organisms you get into a... Uh, uh, a human birth and therefore and we have the ability to make a difference to the world around us so that's what we want to do and finally living our values as I said our values are knowledge action and care so what does knowledge mean knowledge means that whatever we are doing we should have expertise in that in this and we should develop an expertise in the business that we are doing or in the activity that we are doing. We should have innovation because that's the only way you can uh, actually survive in a competitive environment is to become innovative and continuously change. When we talk about action, we talk about being decisive, taking decisive uh, action and of being an entrepreneur. And when we talk about care, we talk about trusteeship, and that's really the concept from the Gita, which talks about how nothing, uh, Maharaj spoke about it in the morning today, that we are just mere caretakers of the wealth that is. So we have to act as trustees for all our stakeholders, and we have to have humility and compassion. So that's how we try to weave in whatever knowledge that is there in the scriptures for us. Ashish, would you like to share the same question? The answer for the same question. I think uh, it's uh, slightly uh, different in a sense. I have been a public servant probably a uh, large part of my life. And for me, uh, there are several aspects to what uh, business for me is. Uh, one is whatever I do has to be useful to the society. And uh, so every aspect of it, I try to measure against whether we are adding value or whether we are taking away the value. And if you are taking away the value, then that is something which we should not be doing. Uh, and in some sense, the value is again a very personal judgment on what you are adding or what you are taking away, right? So in a sense, uh, it is and it is not, you know. Uh, so for me, the the concerns, uh, the person's own sort of, can you answer yourself what you have done is very, very important. Then recently, I asked the question uh, saying, what is important? Uh, I mean, there are four aspects to life in our scriptures, uh, dharma, artha, kama, moksha. So which one is important? And all four have to be in balance. It cannot be you have only dharma, but if you don't have earth, then you don't have dharma also. You require earth to do the dharma. But if you don't have icha, then you don't have earth also. So, and of course, moksha will not come without dharma. So, all these things have to be in balance. And in personal life also, if you have imbalances that comes out in your uh, sort of uh, official life or function life. The other issue which especially public servants, we continue to do, uh, I mean, juggle with, probably private sector also does, is that something is morally right, but legally not allowed. Or morally sort of allowed, but legally not allowed. What do you do? For example, to give you an ex sort of smaller stuff, 20 years back, import of gold was not allowed in India. But morally, everyone thinks gold, I mean, it's not a 
illegal thing or immoral thing to have, right? So what happens, it's called in a, in a st standard jargon of MBA, it's called de facto versus de jure or in legal stuff. But effectively, if something is morally not wrong, but legally wrong, what do you do? And something is morally wrong, but legally allowed, what do you do? For, for example, in stock market itself, the companies uh, do a lot of things which are legally allowed, but it sometimes helps the promoters of the company, but affects the other shareholders of the company. What happens? And legally it is allowed. Now, a lot of people call me up, even media, and there are six, seven channels which keep on commenting on us 24 by 7. And of course, so many news channels and newspapers that somebody mentioned about so many lakhs and crores. So, uh, every sort of every decision an um, entrepreneur takes, rightly, wrongly, and if it is legally allowed, how can I stop it? If I tell him, if I give him advice and he doesn't take it, what happens to that? So, those are the dilemmas we face. But effectively, if you are clear in your mind that what is adding value to the society, you sort of do it yourself, tell others to do, and what is taking away the value from the society, uh, you don't do it at, at least yourself, and if you can influence others, very good. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you. Swamiji, we have heard you say it's important to be in the world and not off the world. In this discussion, as you balance the spirituality and business, how do you think we can achieve it? How do you think we can achieve this in the current context? In our tradition, we have three very important principles to spiritualize our lives. Satsang, sadhana, sadachar. Satsang means when we associate with people who influence us spiritually, who enlighten us, who inspire us. That gives us the way and also the hope that I could do it. Ashish and Ajay, when we see that they are living with spiritual principles and still very successful in what they're doing in their life, to the common people, it gives hope. If they can do it, I could do it. The Bhagavad Gita tells Tad Tad Evi Tarota that what leaders in society on every level exemplify, that's what the common people will follow. So we need such leaders. And satsang, association with like-minded people who enlighten us, encourage us, inspire us with wisdom and example is crucial for our own spiritual lives. Sadhana means our own spiritual practice. When we have that satsang with sadhus or saintly people, then we are inspired that yes, there is a need for me to purify myself. There is something more than just grabbing more and more things to call my own. There is something more substantial and valuable in life than just enjoying my mind and senses. There are real values. <laughs> I am a divine person, a part of God. So when we have that faith, we perform sadhana, which means our own personal spiritual practice. To put some time aside every day, we chant God's names. Meditation, prayer, to actually make that connection, to tune in to that divine principle within us. And then there's sadachar, which means our character the example in which we live our life. And if we have this foundation of enlightening association, a spiritual practice to tune us into this higher power, 
and the will to live by these principles, then yes, each and every one of us has the power to be in this world, but not of this world. Thank you, Samji. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Ashish, to you, uh, a major effort that is going on in the world today is to look at socially responsible investment. And uh, more than me, I'm sure you are aware of uh, many such indices, financial indices that are coming up in the world that tracks performance and social responsibility together. How quickly do you think it can happen in India? And is it happening? And how quickly can it come to India? It's a, it's a common theme uh, across the world. And uh, BS itself has two indices with the Standard & Poor's. Uh, our indices call, uh, are managed by Standard & Poor's and BSE jointly. Uh, it's called S&P BSE Green Index called Green X. And there is one index called Carbon X. It's about carbon usage and stuff like that. Uh, but recently, <clears throat> in 2013, the Parliament of India passed an interesting legislation called Indian Companies Act uh, 2013. We had a Companies Act uh, which was called Indian Companies Act 1956. And then there was an Indian Companies Act which was first set up in 1850. So 1850, then 1956, and then you have 2013. 2013, uh, there is an interesting aspect of it uh, which is basically saying that companies above a particular size in profits need to spend at least 2% of their profits for corporate social responsibility, CSR. And it is a compulsory activity they need to do. And that's a phenomenal change. Uh, for me, uh, corporates are basically artificial entities. Uh, humans are natural entities. We are born and stuff like that. Even animals are natural entities. The corporates come out of the social contract. They come out and they exist because we all agree that they exist as a society. And each time, even a natural entity has to justify its existence. But the artificial entities have to justify their existence even more. Because if they add value to the society, they are allowed to remain there. If they don't, then they can be stopped. And corporates have been a, a cause of great good over last 600 years since they were set up first time. Limited liability companies are not very old. They are very new in a, in a sense of human history. And they've been a cause for great bad also. If you remember the East India Company, which came to India and subjugated India. Uh, so they've been cause for great bad and they've been cause for great good. And most of the modern life has been made possible because of the corporates uh, and the, the way they could organize people including uh, Mr. Piramal, that uh, the normal life today where uh, most people are in middle class, at least in developed countries, and even in India, a lot of people have come into middle classes because of the work that corporates have done. And so, at the same time, society has become more aware and more demanding of that justification they need from the corporates. And earlier, 20 years back, when I used to uh, dis debate uh, the corporates, and corporate governance and sustainability, it was about shareholder protection, minority shareholder protection. Today, we talk about sustainability. That minority shareholder protection issue is still there, but in a minor way. Many of the issues have been resolved. Now we worry about other stakeholders. That includes government, uh, society at large, environment, and so on and so forth. So in a sense, uh, this corporate social responsibility portion of it is very new. First time in the world India has done it. Many people think uh, it's not necessary to do that because corporates are ultimately, uh, they can make guns, make profits and then do a little bit charity. So that, that was the perspective. But today India, the new India, the new Indians, because large part of India is very young. 50% of India is below age 25. And they have a lot of expectations from their own society, but also from the corporates. And this is an interesting perspective that first time a developing country has made social, corporate social responsibility compulsory. It has not, I mean, when I go to very many parts of the world, they totally get freaked out. Even in India, many of us who have not kind of, uh, kind of justified it in our minds, rationalized in our minds, we still think it's not a great idea, let corporates do the profits making and then 
sometimes they can also when you warren buffett makes huge sums sometimes he can donate it and he can feel happy about it but otherwise don't mix them too because they uh, kind of don't go together for me both go together now whether 2% is correct 1% is correct or there is some other way to do it but unless corporates continue to justify to the newer and emerging realities of expectations by young indians they will not get that acceptability and then if they are not accepted then continual questions will be asked on their existence and that's why they need to continue to do more and more and for me i mean of course ajay is a doyen of the industry i am very very young compared to him so he will have probably much more evolved views on this so my view on corporate social responsibility what no, th this is about saying that uh, there are indices today uh, that are that tracks performance which is not just financial but also if i may okay. use the word socially responsible or ethical we don't have it yet in this country yes i mean there are some indices that are doing it but it's not being as the social responsible movement in the rest of the world has moved we have moved to the 2% uh, piece that uh, he's talking about just wanted to understand what's your view on if that in such a movement comes into india so uh, i think uh, certain things uh, they are good if you have an index because people will look at it i don't think they affect the valuations of companies today i haven't seen the, these indices affecting stock valuation abroad they do abroad also it's marginal some people there are small group of investors who really believe in it overall it's not it's more the when the media pressure comes in and all that which is in a way good you need balance in society you need to have uh, a balance and counterbalance so i think it's good because uh, frankly uh, business overall if you look at it ever since modern business has started it business has contributed significantly for as ashi said for the well being of society you know uh, just think of it i was just reading somewhere modern medicine from 1970s only till now in the last 40 years the life span of indians has gone up by 20 years only because of modern medicine take an invention or like toothpaste in the modern world it is because of toothpaste that people's lives have gone up it's such a simple thing that you take because earlier people would not brush their teeth properly and therefore they were you died early so in every sphere actually business has contributed to the well being of people i mean we look at industry so a lot of in, uh, i mean you look at here all the even in an eco village we still need electricity and all this has become because of the innovation that's taken place by business so there is a contribution i think we need to always balance sometimes greed overwhelms everything else when you have greed you destroy the let's say the whole environment you don't care for the people around you i think there needs to be balance in that and to that extent it's good whether we need a csr or not i don't know because frankly in our organization uh, yeah it was just the way we did business even before nothing has changed since the csr has come in in fact i have heard both views uh, some people are misusing this on the other hand i know that there are many organizations that i am involved with and including i think uh, in our midday meal we are now getting more funds because people want to Uh, give to good organizations so it is mixed i think uh, just coming to you i think there is a, a a clear mixed view also on this 2% because there is a view that if you hang if you keep csr outside the main business it can be explained away and today the law allows it to be explained away unfortunately if i say if it was almost kind of it becomes a part of your business like you said then the reason for doing it would be the reason for your business and then it becomes the real purpose of a business doing well by doing good becomes the purpose of the business in unilever where i worked it was all about what is right for india is right for unilever and therefore from our perspective whether it was hand wash or it was it was toothpaste or it was hair wash or a skin cleansing it was a part of saying it is all about something that you make a difference in a small way to people's lives uh sorry no your question 
Srijit, I, I think you've been asking most of the questions and I know you've had a very unusual, unusual for most of us here, an unusual childhood and upbringing in a small village of Odisha and uh, in the shelter of Lord Jagannath, in the land of Lord Jagannath. And I know spirituality has been a compass all your life. So I would request before we wind up, we'd like to hear from you about that. So you can say it now I, I, or later. I will, but I think there is an announcement that uh, Ashish wants to make. I think it's an important one. Let's hear it. Thank you. So uh, since we talked about CSR, uh, BSC is going to uh, set up a CSR exchange, sir. Uh, so I want to make it uh, in presence of Swamiji and Ajay Bhai. So, uh, so basically all NGOs, including uh, everyone sitting here, we can uh, basically re uh, register ourselves and the corporates who want to also put in funds can register and then we'll match and also we'll uh, give details of the progress being made and so on and so forth. So because we have been on our life, 140 years of BSC's history has been about setting up exchanges. We thought this would be our contribution uh, to the society. And we, I thought it'll, I'll make the first uh, announcement in front of this audience. Well, I think it couldn't have been better than this for the panel to announce uh, this year. Ashish, thank you so much. Uh, just one last question for me before I go and summarize the comment. Uh, Ajay, it's to you. Uh, there's also a growing movement of social entrepreneurs and we, uh, who create a social benefit corporation. And in fact, today we heard a very similar example of that. Uh, um, you know, five or six things that Rajiv talked about just before lunch was an example of that. We heard in the morning people say, can we get the rich people down on here to actually begin to contribute to such things we get in a bigger way. Do you think this growing movement of social entrepreneurs is the way to go forward, which will make this uh, entire movement come alive? So, uh, I think it's a good thing that there are so many young people who are willing to uh, take up uh, social entrepreneurship. I think uh, it just, I mean, today I meet many more people who are looking at uh, or doing social entrepreneurship or starting it than ever before. So, it's a good thing. It means also that, you know, social entrepreneurship, when young people come in, there's a lot of innovation that also takes place. You know, the way we progress, whether socially or anywhere else, has to be through innovation. How can you do the same thing or how can you find solutions to the problem? There are problems, there are new ways of doing it. And that's what some of the brightest people are doing. And I think it's uh, growing and it's something that we should all uh, support and encourage because I think that's the way forward. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank the panel uh, for giving us their esteemed views. Uh, I would like to just summarize by saying that um, it gives us a great opportunity to do something for the first time. Uh, my Guruji had told me once very early at the age of 20 that ask yourself this question every year. Are you making a mistake? If you are not, you are not growing. But if you are creating the same mistake, there's a problem. And two, are you doing something for the first time? When was the last time you did something for the first time? I suggest these audience, the audience here ask themselves this question. When was the last time you did something for the first time? That was the time you changed. Here's an opportunity for you Take your, to take your business and to take yourself as an individual and your business forward in a very, very ethical, balanced manner. Allow the human being to come out from inside you. Allow the God in you to take over. Trust yourself, trust your instinct and let God take over. God bless and thank you very much. Well, I'll just say that two experiences uh, that have, um, there are many experiences, but two recent experiences that have shaped uh, who, who, I have, who I have kind of tried to be. Uh, one is, um, early in my career, I met a gentleman called Shunu Sen, 
uh, who I salute uh, by marketing guru. And, uh, and, you know, I was working on a brand called Lifeboy. And I used to wonder what the hell am I doing working on a brand called Lifeboy. Uh, what does soap really do? It's a soap hand wash. When you go to the loo, you wash your hands with it. What am I doing? You know, I was all of... Uh, and I think the best part about this is, uh, Shunu explained to me that, young man, you have a chance to save lives. It is not a soap that you're selling. It's not a germ kill proposition that you're living with. You are selling, you're, sa you're saving lives. Like you said, Ajay, through, through hand wash, millions of lives get saved through simple things like hand wash. And since then, everything that I have done on my brands, in my businesses, with my people, has always been trying to see what's the larger purpose of what we are trying to do. What are we energizing ourselves to do? And what is the, what's the really the larger purpose of this piece? The second was more recent on, in 2611, when uh, our entire past, current, and future of Hindustan Lever then was stuck in Taj and with 30 of us. And what it told me is, uh, it taught me very, in some very simple ways that uh, there is a hand up there. And if you have survived, there is a reason why you have survived. And if you are, if you, if you have, you should find that reason why you have survived. Not say that you have just survived. It is not the heroism of how you survived. It is wanting to look for the reason why you have survived. That makes the biggest difference. And I really love the way we heard you talk about your experience of the reason why you survived through your life. And I think it's very similar uh, in many ways uh, to understand that. The second thing it taught me is real leaders. People whom I had revered, people who had picked me into the organization called Hindustan Lever. People who, and the, all the other people who are staff members of, of Taj and how they conducted themselves. People who survived, who ran in from the other rooms, how they conducted themselves. The real leaders are born during chaos. Real leaders are born at the time when there is life and death staring you at the face. And to me, if you can make every situation simple, and, and I go back to, a, again, a learning that my guru gave me, how do you know something is right or wrong? If you can tell it to your mother proudly that you've done something and it is right, if you can't, it is wrong. And if the, if in, in very, in, 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 in again, simple rules, if you try and keep your life to, to commit yourself to what, what you wanted to do, what, what, what drives you uh, as an individual, uh, I think we will all come a long way. It's been an absolute brilliant experience, an humbling experience for me. Thank you, Swamiji. It's been so nice to have heard you speak today again. And to the esteemed panels, thank you for sharing your, your views. And I look forward to the rest of the sessions. Thank you so much.